Okay, sure. we're going to go ahead and get the panel started. I love it. I'll speak for every <laughs> note. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Catherine Ferentz. I'm the Director of Workforce Development for the Maine Tourism Association. I don't know if I've actually said that yet, so I should probably say that. Um, Today we're here to talk about recruiting from diverse populations. I just want to say before we get started that if we were going to talk about every population that could fall under that heading, we could have a whole day long conference about just that. So we are not going to cover this topic in its entirety by any stretch of the imagination. We're just going to focus on a couple of different populations. Um, on your resources page, on the back of your schedule, uh, there are a few other uh, resources on there for some other populations that we won't be able to talk about today, including employing refugees, uh, if you're interested in, hello? Okay. Interested in hiring veterans, um, some information from the career centers, so, as well as the programs we're gonna talk about today. But I just wanted to point that out. Um, we have here a couple of program uh, representatives who represent particular programs that help particular populations get hired and then a couple of employers who have used those programs so we'll be able to hear from a um, employer perspective and also a program perspective uh, so just as we get started here um, for the uh, for the people who are with programs if you could just introduce yourself and your program what it is how it works so Tavin if you want to start Good. Uh, well, actually, and uh, yeah, and who you are as well. <laughs> <laughs> good. Thank you, and and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Taban Tangila Mesukamba. It's a long name. Um, I work for uh, Coastal Enterprises Inc. Uh, CEI. Uh, we are based in in Brunswick, and uh, we are a community financial institution. We lend money to businesses. Uh, sometime, sometimes businesses that uh, bank don't uh, touch because it is a high risk, but uh, not all of them. Uh, and um, when we lend money to businesses, we do ask them if they can uh, invest back in the community by hiring individuals who face a barrier to employment. Um, that's how we create that bond between CEI and our portfolio of businesses that we work with. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Liz Nitzel, and I work for the Maine Department of Labor, and I'm representing the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. Um, we support individuals who are looking for employment who have barriers that are related to a disability. And what I'd really like for everyone to know is that the disability is not the barrier. It's the access to employment. So I'm hoping that we can all work together and help anyone who's seeking employment get a job. So that's my goal and we're statewide. We're statewide, so wherever you are, there's no wrong door. So that, that's my, my spiel today, my beginning spiel. And for the employers, uh, what is your, who are you, who, uh, what is your business, and how is it involved with diversity and inclusion, both through these programs and, and if you're involved with any other programs as well? Um, my name is Tony Delois. I am uh, co-principal and chief operating officer for Uncommon Hospitality. We're a hotel management development company uh, running two hotels in the Gunkwit, the Colonial Inn, the Admiral's Inn, and two, or soon to be two, in, in Portland, the Francis Hotel and Spa and the Longfellow Hotel. Um, How yeah. are you involved with these diversity <laughs> inclusion through these programs and uh, in yes. any other way? So, um, so uh, when, we, when we opened uh, the Francis Hotel in 2017, we got a loan from CEI, and uh, through that came a lot of resources for workforce development. And, uh, and that sort of started, that I guess opened my, you know, I guess uh, opened up the, the pathways to hiring a, a much more diverse population and we've kept those open. Shay? Hi, my name is Shay Bell. I'm the Assistant General Manager at Point Sebago Resort. Um, prior to returning back to Maine, I lived in, in Kilimanjaro, Tanzania for seven years. Um, working with street connected youth, um, particularly in hospitality in that area. So this is a passion of mine. Um, we recently partnered with Liz 
um, and really looking to reduce the barriers to employment. Wonderful. So for all of you, um, so today we're talking about recruiting from quote unquote diverse populations. Um, what is your de definition of diversity and why is it important for businesses to consider it? And we can start with yeah, Evan. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Um, I think the diversity goes behind race and uh, ethnicity. Uh, d diversity is um, when a business like you uh, thinks that every employee who work for you belongs and is included. Um, it, it's also when businesses are open to hire uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, no matter their uh, race, ethnicity, um, gender, or sexual orientation. And um, that you should, you should have intention to do that. Mm. And that comes with many benefits uh, for your business. Okay. Now, Tony, um, you said that you kind of got involved with CEI because of the loans, of yep. course, so that's probably why you approached them, I, I assume, is that correct? Yeah. So, but then it kind of comes with this, you're recruiting and, and opening pathways and stuff. Is that something that you were doing before or is this kind, was this kind of new to you when you went through CEI and then like how did that, what kinds of populations did you end up hiring that you hadn't hired before? Right, so I mean with our two hotels that we had been operating before 2017 in Agunquip, we participate in the, the H2B programs. Mm -hmm. We hire pretty much 85% of our staff through those. Um, and when we were up in Portland, uh, there wasn't a need for the, the H2B program. You know, we uh, discovered a lot more programs with CEI. And uh, in, in looking at that, I mean, it sort of speaks to the sort of the business that we want to run, which is, I mean, we want to be open at least to um, all walks of life, people with all sorts of backgrounds and experiences. Um, you know, everyone probably has their non-discriminatory clause in, in their guidebook, but um, that, that doesn't mean that you're actively going out and, and looking for groups. It just means that if someone happens to come to you, that you won't discriminate. Um, and we were, uh, at least in the early stages of hiring, you know, sort of before really connecting with CEI, you know, the very classic, you know, put it out on Indeed or, or Craigslist, but you're, it's a very narrow group of, of uh, uh, applicants that you're drawing from. Uh, and after connecting with CEI, you know, you realize that there's just, there's so many other options out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, the struggle for finding employees is not as great uh, because there's a lot, of pe a lot of people out there that need jobs. Um, and you just have to be willing to look. Uh, our our staff at the Francis is comes from all varieties of backgrounds. You know, recent uh, refugees and asylum seekers, uh, people that are you know uh, identify as uh, a queer. Um, just I mean, it's a small staff, but it is highly diverse. Some individuals that don't speak any languages uh, other than their their native languages. Uh, I think it's important. You know, just to be able to uh, take the time and, and create a safe environment for everyone. Liz, we, we learned uh, this morning with, through Mark's presentation that he call, specifically called out disability as somebody, as a group that is, I think he said three times more likely to be unemployed. Can you just kind of explain why that is and, and historically and? Um, so I don't know if I can explain fully why that is. But I'm going to say that it's um, discrimination. That's what I'm going to say. Um, when we think about disability, we think, what can't somebody do? <coughs> um, and, and we're all guilty of it. We immediately think, oh, I don't, I don't know if that person, well, we don't even know that person yet. So we don't know, based on a disability, what somebody can't do we know that somebody has a disability. That may or may not impact the job in any way, shape, or form. 
um, when we're looking at work, we want to look at with or without an accommodation, can this person do the minimum requirements of the job? And from there, we want to expect excellence. We want to expect, can they move forward? And most often, they can. So what I would say about the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services, which covers any disability that is impacted with getting a job, we would look at DEI. I've gone to many, many DEI, as I'm sure many of you have, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what I rarely hear is disability. Rarely do I hear that. And you know, I go and I think, oh, this is gonna be where I, where I come in because of course disability would be part of DEI, but often they leave off the A. So it should be DEIA for access and um, accommodation. So when we think of disability, it's going to impact all of us if we're fortunate enough to live long enough. So, so disability is going to cover every, every group. There'll be no group that is not impacted by disability. So really, I want, I want that to be part of the conversation, and I don't want people to be afraid of talking about, can you do the job? How do you do the job? How can we make this work? Um, so that's the part that I'm going to bring today. So as a follow, kind of a follow-up to that, Shay, the thing that I have heard sort of in the miasma of the world uh, from hospitality and tourism people specifically when it comes to disability is that it's historically been kind of a young person's game in a general sense and that you know, it's a very physical job. People have to be on their feet quite a lot. The hours are long. And so you know, even if hypothetically they think, oh, yeah, of course, people with disability could do the job, they, but not my job. And has that been the case for you as, as an employer? Like, what has been your experience with that specifically? You know, I think we, um, we lose when we don't open our minds. Uh, especially in hospitality, there's so many jobs that encompass. So, so we need to look outside of the box. Um, we've had a great experience here uh, for jobs that um, it's matching. We, interests. Interests. Um, it's matching skills and desire, we're in hospitality, right? Half the battle is wanting to be there and the desire to be there and the excitement to be there. And we are overlooking an entire population in that we have a need, they want to fill. So job carving, job carving um, accommodations, all of those things can be scary as an employer, but I think they're necessary. They're, they're important and that's what we do. Well, what is job carving? So looking at a position as a whole, you may carve out certain aspects of that position to meet the needs of a prospective, uh, a prospective employee. Uh, so for the program people, um, <laughs> describe how you work with employers and what you can offer and, and like how, how, what have you have done for these employers specifically. We can start with you, Tabin. Oh yeah, good, uh, thank you. Uh, basically, when a business comes to, to CEI, the first thing I do is the, what I call the workforce assessment. I sit down with the business to see what uh, are their workforce need. Um, and then they may talk about many other things on the top of that, but I will see what I can do based on my expertise. And um, also, I will uh, look at the, the top challenges uh, in, in the workforce. And if this is related to hiring uh, people of diverse background, uh, then we will sit down with them to, to customize the solutions based on what they're looking for. Um, but um, if that is related to, to because we, have, we work with some businesses that they, they don't have uh, HR uh, personnel, and we can help them with drafting some um, uh, employee handbook policies related to, to diversity inclusion. We can uh, help them draft a DEI statement and, and all of that. 
Um, yeah, so it, this goes, you know, from uh, best to, uh, uh, from business to businesses because each business is, is different uh, from from each other. What types of populations do you tend to work with? Um, we work with everybody uh, who face barrier to employment. Uh, we work with folks who are in uh, public assistance, uh, such as uh, TNF, and for that, we work with uh, FedCap, who has a contract in, in Maine to, to surface the candidate. We work with Goodwill, who surface candidate uh, from really diverse background, could be folks who have been uh, out of addiction, uh, people of justice background. Uh, we, you know, work with <laughs> veterans, uh, you know, people of different sexual orientation. So we, we really, we have network of um, all of those organizations. And uh, when a business tells me, hey, I'd love to hire such type of uh, uh, diverse candidate based on my business need, based on what I want to achieve, and then we sit down and see what uh, strategies that we can come up with to, to achieve what, what they want to do. Liz, how do you work with employers? All right, how do I work with employers? How do we, we work? So what I, what I really, I mentioned before, no wrong door. I work for the Department of Labor, so I want to make sure if you have a need, I'm going to bring that back and connect that to the right person. I don't want you to have to call everybody within the Department of Labor. Why not call one person and get some help and get some outreach and get somebody to get back to you? Um, our big thing is employer engagement, finding out what do you need, what do you need, and then figuring out how can we, how can we fill that. If you have recruitment needs, then I want to bring that back and look at who works in your area and who has a caseload of interested people who have barriers from dis with disability and make connections. Make connections, get people out to meet with you and talk with you and find out more about your business. We have um, a beautiful strategy that we're using and it's it's really unrolling throughout Maine, actually across the nation. It's called progressive employment. And um, you don't need to remember the terminology or anything like that. But basically what progressive employment is, is having a job tour, having an informational interview, having an opportunity to shadow the work, and then maybe having the opportunity for a paid work experience which could be paid by us or it might be paid by you. But it's having that employee, that new, that new worker, or maybe a re-entering worker, um, because it could be somebody, could be a youth, could be an adult. Um, we have no idea why somebody is looking for job change or, or re-entry. Um, it could be many, many different populations of people. But um, with that strategy, We've actually had employers who have changed how they hire. Because if you think about it, bringing somebody in for a tour and an informational interview and really finding out right then and there, is this a good match? And deciding before you move forward with anything is a pretty good strategy so that you're not hiring somebody and 12 weeks later you're hiring someone new and, and somebody new and somebody new. And we know that that happens. So trying to get some strategies out there that work for the person to find out, is that really what I'm interested in? Is this a good fit? Does it feel well? Does it feel right? And that's where we've worked with Point Sebago. We started with a summer youth program, bringing students out to get familiar with the different jobs, to get tours, to get opportunities, and then to have paid summer, summer experiences. So that's where we started, but that's not where we're ending. Um, so maybe the employers could give me some like examples of some of the people that you've hired through these programs. Obviously, not naming names, but like like you know kinds of people that have sort of filled into particular positions, or just some examples of what that job carving might look like, that kind of thing. And we can start with Tony. Okay. Um, so. Uh, 
right now, um, we're opening up our, our, our newest hotel, at least in like <coughs> four months. It seems like it's right now. Um, and, uh, you know, we've worked with, with Tabin. Um, but, you know, I think, I guess the, the popular, uh, some hires that we've made, I mean, you know, we, we end up with a lot of our housekeeping staff comes from, I guess, from a more diverse population, at least, um, you know, visually. Uh, and um, uh, front desk is a little bit more difficult because uh, there are a little bit more barriers. Um, I, I, think, I think our niche tends to be uh, new Mainers that come in um, and, and refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, that I mean that that's pretty much the population that we find ourselves, you know, uh, hiring from. Shay, um, the two that we had over this summer, we had one young gentleman. It was his first job. Um, he um, was autistic, and he worked in our restaurants, um, helping with bus tables, helping roll silverware. Our servers were were very grateful uh, to have someone to do to support those duties. Uh, he was part of our family, and I think that's important too. It makes uh, not it makes our team stronger. It exposes them to things that they wouldn't necessarily be exposed to. Uh, it makes our teams more empathetic, more compassionate. And let's face it, that's the business we're in. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other young gentleman, it was. I believe he was 16 and it was his first job. So he scooped ice cream for us this summer. Uh, he loved, he found his family. We, we call it the work family, right? That's what we are, that's what we do. So it's just a great way. And I think as leaders in the hospitality industry, it's our job to mentor the youth, right? To expose them uh, to something different. We have this, we have this beautiful thing called, called hospitality and the soft skills that they learn while they're there are unlike anything. You can read as many textbooks as you want, but until you experience and are in it, that's that's the true gift. Wonderful. Um, so we kind of hear about when we talk about diversity, like you know, they're sort of recruiting from diverse populations. I think a lot of people are sort of immediately interested in because ooh, more people. Uh, but then there's also sort of in the in the world, there's talk about like DEI statements and some of that fluffier stuff, I guess we could call it. And I just wonder from all of you, is a DEI statement, like is, excuse me, is that where you should start? Like is that, is that step one or, or is that not as necessary? Oh, can I jump in? Yes, please. <laughs> um, so we also offer windmills training. And um, I know some of you here in the audience have had windmills training, but windmills training is a, a disability employment inclusive program that targets management staff to help them see like what barriers might I be bringing when I'm interviewing somebody? And do I have fears about supervising somebody that, that has different skills or, or learns differently than, than I do? So that's a, that's a resource that we offer. And through that, we've had some companies reach out and say, can you help us with our DEIA statement? Can you help us write this? Because we want to be welcoming and we want to be inclusive. And what I will say that that immediately does for the team that you already have working is it lets them know that this, this is important. This is who we are. So not only for the people you're recruiting, but for who you currently are, it's saying, this is meaningful. We're going to work at this. We're going to see how do we invite more folks to our table. And you know, when you, when you look around the room and you see who are you inviting, because if you're inviting, they're here. If you're inviting them, they're, they're already working for you. So if you look around your table and everybody doesn't have a seat, you want to go back to that original drawing and you want to make sure that you are showing that you are accessible, that you want to hire a diverse group, and you're going to put your time and effort into it. So I think that it starts at home and it grows outward. And then job seekers see, wow, they're willing to have an accommodation. They're, they're looking for a diverse group. I want to go apply there. So it, it, it feeds everybody. That's what I think. 
I think Tony said it in the beginning, it's more than just having a statement for your company. You know, we all have statements, but it's walking the walk. Mm. So it's being intentional with your recruiting. It's being intentional with your programs. Like Liz just said, that says something to your current teams. That says something to the public. Um, and that's our responsibility to, to do that. Tony? Uh, more on that, I mean, uh, you know, your, our actions are going to uh, speak more than, than our DEIB or DEIA now that I'm learning about that. Um, uh, we do not specifically have one, and we have the non-discriminatory uh, clause, obviously, as, as employers, but, um, you know, things that we do that are not, like, if we think about our business, I guess, in total as a hiring platform, um, you know, we're out there you know, with our, with our charity and uh, philanthropic giving to, you know, these organizations and we're proud of that and we let people know. And hopefully that's like another recruiting tool for, you know, people that are looking or members of those organizations or, or are supported by those organizations. I mean, it's, it's really just thinking about, I mean, everything is recruiting. I mean, everything you do is recruiting and what sort of message are you putting out there, not just um, in, a, in a statement. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I would say the DEI statement is, uh, is important because it, um, it shows that you do care about people who are around you in your community. It shows also your commitment that to uh, fostering a um, diverse uh, environment into your company. But also it should go behind that. Um, uh, when you have the best um, uh, people working for you in your company, uh, please uh, treat them the same way you would like to be, um, you know, treating yourself. And be fair uh, and um, give them access to advancement. Mm. That, 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 that is more important and it will help you to retain them because the simple statement on your website, everybody can do that. But being intentional in fostering the change that you'd love for your business, which is, by the way, very benefit for your business because, as I said before, the diverse uh, people, when you hire them, they will, they will bring with them the, the different perspective. They will bring with them the different mindset. They will bring with them different experiences. They will bring with them uh, uh, different knowledge, right? And all of the, the knowledge, they will share them with people that we work with. And this is a win for your business. Mm -hmm. And it will bring also good reputation yep. for your business. People will be like, wow, look what they are doing. And many would love to come to stay at your hotel. Why? Because they see that you're doing good thing in the community, giving opportunity to people who otherwise wouldn't have them. And not because they are black or brown, but because they have qualifications. They are just looking for opportunity. So I think, you know, in theory, everybody's kind of like, yeah, diversity, yes, absolutely. But then, you know, maybe there are things that they are subconscious, like, of course, you just said actions are more important than, than saying things. And, and maybe sometimes, like, we're not, at, like, are there sub things that maybe a business is doing subconsciously? Or, or maybe, maybe you can call out s some things you've seen <laughs> that people are doing that are, maybe subconsciously sort of pushing people away or not inviting diversity or phrased another way, are there things that businesses can do, actions that they can do very purposefully to try to be more inclusive or like send that message maybe, Tavin? Oh yes, um, I, I think I can speak to some, 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 some aspect. Um, when you hire somebody who is from a different culture and land in your uh, business, uh, I'd love to remind you that every society, every group has some hidden rules mm -hmm. that no one else knows, mm -hmm. right? Like in, here in the U.S., when I came to the U.S., I didn't know that when I should speak with somebody, I should give you eye contact, right? And yeah. that is not written anywhere. You may not find that anywhere, but it, <laughs> it 
Exactly. But somebody should tell me, hey, you know, when you talk. And the same thing, when you welcome folks in your organizations, there are things that are not written in your employee handbook, in your policies. Please be mindful to tell folks those things, those things right away. They should know them. For example, when you are late and you need to talk, excuse yourself. If somebody doesn't do it the first time, the second time, what will you say? Oh, oh, that guy is not. So, and you can go behind that. What are some of your hidden rules that you have that people who are not part of this culture can know? Um, Beside that, you have um, many folks, let's say, if they are immigrants or refugees, when they come here, they go through a stage of instability because some may rely, maybe for the first, second year, on public assistance. They may um, have appointment here and there. They have children. and. They, they don't have relatives, right? They can rely on. They don't have support system uh, to, to strive the situation. And you hire them. Please be mindful. They may not have transportation. And if they may show up late one time or two times, don't say they are, ne ne they are neglect. No, it's because in situation where they are, and uh, let's be passionate when, and compassionate when we hire them. And that may go for one year. And after that, they'll become stable. They will have a driver license. They will have a car. And things will change. So we just need to have that support system also in the workplace. Let's say if you hire somebody coming out of addictions, they may have appointment to go to talk to the physicians because they need the medication or they need X, Y, Z things. And they don't do it because they have, but because they have to do that to survive. And uh, let's be mindful of that when we work with, with, with people. Uh, but also talk about the benefit that you offer. I'm very surprised to see that some folks, immigrant, refugees, whatever, don't take advantage most of the time of 401k, 4b that that retirement they offer. It's because this is a new system. Mm -hmm. Where they are coming from, they didn't have it. And when they come here, please have it. But also have a mentor. Mentor, somebody who can tell them how things work within your organizations, within your company, maybe for six months. Just have a regular check-in with them. All of that help. It helps. And you will see, when you have that in place, people will see like, wow, this is a place to stay. But on the top of that, if you have diverse population who succeed in your organizations, other people will see that. You see, wow, me too. I can be like them tomorrow. So I have a place here to succeed. Um, so thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. That was great. So have diverse people in your in higher leadership is what I'm hearing from that. And then make sure that your hidden culture is made explicit. Exactly. And yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. Tony, thank do you, you. you want to add anything to that? Um, no, to that. Uh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, no, that was good. Um, I guess maybe going back to the original question about what we see, um, I think two things are important, training, ongoing training. Um, we obviously have, you know, whatever, I mean, hospitality, uh, you know, the training tends to be very quick, but what sort of ongoing training do you have to then, um, uh, once, you know, your employee is comfortable and then maybe you learn about some of these nuances of a cultural difference, like what sort of uh, training do you have for them? And then also um, people that are in the hiring position, what, you know, continuously going over with them, uh, how to look at a resume. Um, I know Shay said um, that you know, the hospitality industry tends to be younger, um, and one thing that I do see a lot of is when a resume comes in, and the dates are 
for something maybe in the 90s or early 2000s. I mean, the ageism, I, I would say, is a, is a prevalent um, uh, barrier in, in hospitality and being able to, to work with your hiring managers or people that are in higher positions to, to like, you have to, you got to see through all of that and, uh, you know, what, what, you know, what benefit or what experiences are we going to gain from, from being very open to um, all people. Uh, and especially given Maine's aging population, I yes. think that's yep. going to become absolutely less. Yep. Yeah, I think that that was um, a wonderful staging for all of us. <laughs> you, you helped all of us because we all have the hidden culture that, that somebody walking in may not know. And the funny thing is, because we are soaking in the culture, we don't know that we carry that, that bias. Sorry for beating on my um, <laughs> microphone. But um, I'll give you an example. Um, many of us, so I want you to raise your hand if you've ever heard this. You can tell something about a person by shaking their hand. Has anyone heard that? Thanks. So. All right. If you just sit with it for a moment, what do you really know about that person by shaking their hand? <laughs> Think about that for a moment. You don't have to comment, but what do you really know about an individual by shaking their hand? You know their grip strength. You know um, whether or not their arm is um, strong or, or, or not strong, but you don't know their work ethic. You don't nervous. know. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know anything by shaking somebody's hand. But we've all been soaking in that culture that says, oh, shake their hand. So what if you shake somebody's hand and they have a shoulder injury? or they have um, some type of dexterity problem that has nothing to do with this job. You've just discredited somebody on something that has nothing to do with the job and you've set yourself up to not get a great employee. So those are some things when we're going into a hiring situation. I just want you to think about that you may be bringing something in that is not factual. Um, people with disabilities often have to go to three, four, five, six more interviews than a person without a disability to get a job. Okay. Now, if you think of that on the flip end, you could be thinking like, oh, well, that's too bad for them, but it's actually too bad for you because you might be missing the opportunity to hire a great employee mm -hmm. based on something that you're carrying inside of you that you're, that you're not aware of. <coughs> so when you're interviewing somebody that looks different than you, that may do the job differently than you, really sit back for a minute, whether that's a person with a disability or a person from a different, a different demographic, sit back for a minute and think about the job description. Can this person do the job? And how can we find that out? because that's what you're really hiring for. And then every, what everyone has said, when you bring diversity to your work group, you get more, you get so much more. You get a funny story at the end, end of the day, whether that's because there was a misunderstanding or for whatever reason, you get more conversation, you get more people wanting to come to your business. Um, you, it's, it's an inviting workplace. So those are some things that when you're not hiring people based on a subtle reason that you don't know about, you're missing out. So we're here to connect and the neat thing is we all kind of work together whether we know it or not because usually the Department of Labor is behind some other agency that you're working with. So um, when Tabin and I first met, he said, I work with Goodwill. And I said, we work with Goodwill. And so, so we're actually all connected. You said, I work with FedCap. And I said, I work with FedCap. You know, so so we're, all, we're all connected. So just reach out, we'll help. Shay? I think one of the um, barriers to employment, one of the things we are working on is going through all of our job descriptions for our um, every 
every, every job that we have on property and car, we talked about job carving and carving out different skills. And we plan to have a job fair on site just for those with disabilities. So Liz, that's one of the projects we're working for in the spring. It's intentional. We're setting them up for success. But I also think it's important that we're setting expectations. Just because someone has a disability doesn't mean that we need to lower or change our expectations as a company. Mm -hmm. We're not teaching them anything when we do that. So we have the same expectations as we would any of our employees, and, and we're building their confidence through that. Can I add a comment? Yes, uh, I'd love uh, to add a comment um, on the, the job description. This is something I've, I've, I've done with um, a few businesses uh, who really are intentional in hiring people from different backgrounds. Um, the, the first thing I tell them is, uh, please uh, take a look at your job posting. Because uh, when, when you put out there, it, it can be in online or whatever, represent you and um, and when you look at the, the the duties of the job or you look at the the qualifications of the job sometimes some businesses put out there uh, 50 or 40 uh, qualifications and, and it's just too much mm -hmm. and this can be intimidated for some folks who are not used to the culture we have here in the US. They will say, oh, this is too much. I cannot do it. But are all the qualifications, all the duties, do you really want somebody to come today and know all of this? Right away, the answer is no. You may not. And even when you look at the, 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 the education, do you really want somebody with a bachelor degree to do this job? Mm. And when you sit down and look at that, you may find that you don't. Some skills, somebody may learn them, is you unbought them. And uh, it's a good time for you to, to set up your expectations. But you don't need all of that up front because some things people may learn as, as they, they come in. So job posting is important, but also having your DI statement is there is very appealing to folks you are looking to hire. People just will say, ha, ah, I can belong there. They want me. Uh, as you may know, other businesses may not put anything but by putting that out there, it's something that can, uh, you know, at least attract uh, folks to apply for your position. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think that for a lot of people, uh, they're like like you mentioned, Liz. There's kind of an ecosystem. Everybody's kind of working with everybody. Everybody's connected with everybody. But as somebody as an outsider, it can can be very intimidating mm -hmm. to sort of look at that system and be like. Okay, I'm kind. I know there's some stuff out there, but like, how do I, who do I how is how do you, how what would your advice to businesses who are interested in sort of getting involved with some of these programs or interested in starting down this journey? What would your advice be to them? And we can start with you, Tabin. Oh, okay, that 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 is a good question. Uh, how to start? Uh, I'd love first uh, be intentional. Have the intention to uh, make that change in your business because it's something good. Um, but also put that change in your employee handbook and the policies. It should be clear. And you should tell your hiring managers, better train them on why the, the diversity is important for your business. Uh, train them so then they can be aware of that. There is some awareness. We don't want any, anyone to change who they are, but just to be aware of that. If you work with you know, people, uh, be aware of some sensitivity that is around uh, who they are and their difference. 
Um, the the other thing is is that um, don't don't be afraid. You can start the diversity and inclusion with little um, money and sometimes time. Uh, you have a program such as adult educations in every county here in Maine, and uh, these are places where. If you want to hire uh, people who came to America, you may find them there because they go there to learn English. Even myself, I went to Portland, adult education is where I, I learned. Um, so this is a place you can go, start. Hey, you know, I'm looking to hire some folks here and, uh, and they may help you. But also you can reach out to organizations such as uh, um, uh, main uh, Department of Labor. We can reach out to CEI. We can help you. Uh, the thing you should not do is please don't just post your job, mm. but engage and network with uh, people you are looking to hire <laughs> and invest in those communities. Then you will build the trust between you and those communities, they will know you, right? Like when we talk about the Francis, folks know the Francis in Portland, they know. Why? Because they are there, you know, they, they, they come forward. When there is an event and stuff like that, they are there. So be present in the community. And uh, I think that that's how you can, um, you know, you can hire and attract uh, folks from Diverse uh, background. Tony, you want to yeah. start on the line? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, more to that. I mean, so we hosted uh, a, um, I guess, a information session with a, a number of organizations uh, that we got through uh, Tabin and CEI, uh, Department of Labor, Goodwill, and just like he said, I mean, every one of them was like, if you have an hour, just come down, right? Get yourself in front of whatever, you know, whatever organization. Speak to some of the people and you're already like 75% of the way there. Uh, you, they become familiar with you, you know, uh, I'm specifically thinking about a youth organization in Portland. Mm -hmm. They become familiar with you and so that when you do have a job opening, the people looking for jobs will be like, oh, I remember, I remember Tony came in. I remember, you know, these things because um, my understanding is that one of the barriers to entry is just the familiarity oh. with wherever anyone is going to go apply for a job. It's sort of they get maybe cold feet or they're just unsure because they're not they don't know anything about the organization. Just spending that little bit of time in with the group will will open up a lot of doors. Um, this is such a huge, huge question, and I was thinking, <laughs> where where do I want you to all go? And um, I, I really want you to come to the main Department of Labor if you're looking for hiring needs. If you have hiring needs, um, a lot of people think of the main Department of Labor as unemployment compensation, which of course that is a piece, but, but we have the main job link. We have hiring fairs. We have um, a little tab right on the Career Center that says um, disability. Click on that, you'll get right to us. Um, you know, I want you to, to work with us and get the free resources that your tax dollars pay for and, and see that we provide great service. So um, if, if you're thinking about what we do, so Vocational Rehabilitation or the Bureau of Rehab Services has connections statewide. We start working with high school students and special ed departments, so we work closely with education, um, to start developing transition planning. Because we want to make sure that when individuals with disabilities graduate from high school, they're connected to the next step. So we want to make sure that a high school junior or senior is thinking, what do I want to do when I grow up? So our focus is a lot on, on building interest um, thinking about what is out there, whether that be education or training or directly into employment. But then we're looking at that for every age. So that could be a 40-year-old who has, maybe they were a Class A truck driver and they had an accident. 
and now they need to think about something else. So we work with a very diverse population <coughs> right within. But um, so I think if you start with the Department of Labor, start with the Career Center, you're going to get connected with all of us because we also work with our WIOA partners, which are the adult eds, the community colleges, um, CEI, um, everyone. So we're all, we are connected and you do have a one stop with your career center, wherever that is close to you. Um, I think just again, intention, I love the word intention. It's my favorite <laughs> word, uh, but be intentional with recruiting. You know, the days of everyone coming to us and, and, and those are gone, right? We have to be intentional. We have to network. We have to get out there in front of people. Um, imagine if you go to a foreign country and you don't speak the language. It's a little scary, right? I know when I moved to Tanzania, I was scared to death. Um, but you learn and it's about making diverse populations comfortable too. And, and, and looking at your policies, looking at, at what you're putting in your handbook, it's not the same for everyone. We're not a one size fits all um, company anymore, right? And, and so be intentional, get out there, network. So if somebody's sort of thinking about getting started and, and networking and connection, like obviously that's so important, but we also have a limited number of hours in a day, obviously, and people are already short staffed, so they're crazy busy. So I guess, um, starting with Shay, we'll go in reverse order. Um, <laughs> would you say that it's better to sort of deeply build connections with what you say, okay, I think that my jobs will be a really good fit for X population and then like work to super build connections for that one group or kind of do some connecting and with multiple different groups? Would, like if you were thinking strategy wise and the best way to spend your hours in a day? Uh, you know, I th that's a tough question in that mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's a personal question for each owner. Mm -hmm. So if someone's passionate about a particular group and they really want to concentrate on that, it's great. Um, time is precious, but again, our teams are only going to be as good as we invest in them. Uh, so that time is, is, I think you get back tenfold what you put in. Liz? Um, yes, that's, so the neat thing about disability is it crosses and intersects with every group. So I don't think that you can miss it. Um, I think regardless of what group you're looking to work with, you're going to be connected with individuals with disabilities. So I think it's really important to um, know the Bureau of Rehab Services and um, know about accommodations and, and work closely with us. But um, ultimately, I want everyone to have a job. So, and I want everyone to have a great worker and I want everyone to have a story in the evening, whether they're saying, oh, I had the worst day of work or I had the best day of work. You know, we want everyone to have um, an opportunity to be part of this, be part of the connection. Um, it means, think about all of, think about your own self and how much your work means to you. You know, nobody should be barred from that because they're from a diverse culture or they have a disability. Nobody, sh nobody should be barred from that opportunity. So we wanna find how do we make it work. Um, so I guess, of course, I want to be connected to you, um, but I'm thinking that we can we can all piggyback on each other. Tony, um, I agree. Shay, really difficult uh, to answer. Obviously, um, as someone who hires and coming from a, a, a place of privilege, I mean, to say I'm going to pick or choose one group or another. Um, I don't know if I would feel comfortable saying that, but um, be very open. I think, uh, you know, start with, you know, if we, if you are looking to diversify, I would maybe just look at a particular group just to make inroads and then start there and then in, in word of mouth would really quickly diversify uh, your work, um, your employment base. If, uh, you know, if you're, if you're making really good headway with, say, the, uh, you know, new main um, population, uh, word of mouth is really, really strong. Um, and I think you can just build from there and then 
you know, open up, I guess, as things progress. Oh, oh yes, um, I, I agree with if my um, uh, predecessors, uh, what they said, uh, I think it uh, it depend on um, you know your business need and well what type of uh, employees are you looking for and uh, how comfortable are you um, getting out of the comfort zone and, <laughs> and go reach out to to, to folks. Uh, but again, this this should be a personal decision for each each business. But you know, uh, you can start small and hoping that uh, in in a few years you can you can have uh, what you have as dream uh, employees in your workforce. So before we open up for questions, just any final thoughts that you want to add? Maybe we didn't get to, or something you want to make sure you say before we before we open it up for questions, Kevin. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Um, maybe something. I may say is that uh, the diversity will, uh, not will, but it brings uh, higher productivity. This is, it is uh, research and data has proven that uh, diversity will bring uh, creativity for your business. It, it, it will bring better um, uh, problem solving for your business and it comes with um, decreasing the turnover because uh, when you treat folks well as I said before they will stick around for for many years for you which is good for your <laughs> business um, and it brings a good reputation for your business and goodwill from the community um, so please don't hesitate diversify your workforce if you can now thank you I mean I guess uh, one final note would be you know if you have a vision or mission statement of your business you know I I don't think uh, the hurdle is to is that great in in, in hiring for DEI BA um, because you're all going to be working towards the same the same goal um, and that is you know whatever your business goals are so makes it a lot easier. Um, I would say that um, at the Bureau of Rehab Services, we work with individuals. We work with a lot of individuals, but we work with individuals who may have an occupational goal that meets your hiring need. So that's something um, really important for you to know is we may have a candidate that is available and has the skills and interests that you're looking for. So um, we have an unta untapped labor pool. Um, so it's important to, to know that and be able to connect with us. Um, it may work out beautifully, it may not, but then we just keep moving forward and, and fine tuning things. Okay. I'm like, I think every, what he said, what he said, what she said. <laughs> um, we really love our partnership with Liz. I encourage anyone, uh, you know, just thinking about what the incredible resources in this room are. Um, I think that's probably why we're all here today uh, for our businesses to see what's out there. Because I think oftentimes when we're in our, our bubble, right, our hospitality bubble, working 100 hours a week and grinding it, we're not looking at these resources. We're not seeing what's out there. So. Thank you for putting this together. I think it's an incredible um, event and uh, encourage everyone, all business owners to, to reach out, reach out to Liz, reach out to Tobin. There's so many untapped resources out there for us. Thank you all. Uh, so we're gonna open up for questions. Bailey's in the back with the microphone, so she'll bring it to you. Uh, do we have any questions? Anybody? Yeah, there's one. Hi, thank you all for um, your presentations today. This has been amazing. Um, we do really well with hiring our diverse population from different populations, you know, creating programs of acceptance within our workforce and our place of employment. Um, a challenge I've come across, especially in our more rural towns, is how to get towns and businesses 
to accept these diverse populations as a whole because my workers love working for us but i you know they go into other areas or other towns and businesses and don't feel as accepted so i'm trying to find ways to um foster that acceptance within the community as a whole do you have any advice there i, I it really goes with training right <laughs> the windmills training they offer um there's also the reverse culture training, right, that we have to do. So it's about acceptance, but let's face it, in some areas, it, you know, it's not as accepted and it's difficult. You have to, when, when we were in Tanzania, a big part of our work was not just working with the street connected youth, but working with the community to, to do away with the stigma. And, and so I think that is just as much an obligation when you, when you go down this path as, as it is to the employee itself, mm -hmm. to the towns around you too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, training is a is, is a way to go. Um, you have different type of trainings, uh, such as uh, implicit bias. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the training that is important because some actions we may be doing, you don't know that this is not a welcoming uh, attitude or actions. You do it because you have been used to it, but with uh, some people with differences uh, in your community, it's good to be aware of that. So there is that awareness training that, that we, can, we can bring to your community. Um, I'm part of the diversity hiring coalition uh, it's an organization where we work with leaders. Uh, we, we train uh, um, HR professionals. We, we train leaders in the community. And we can connect and see how you know, we, can, we can provide any help that we can that uh, just make sure that people are aware of that. When people know, people tend to to, to change how they perceive and how they uh, they deal with other folks. I'm not a panelist, but I just want to add that if it's like people in a community in a rural town that you're trying to deal with, um, familiar, like anyone moving to a rural town in Maine, no matter where they came from, feels a little bit like an outsider, right? So I think if you can do community events, for example, where you're inviting your employees who are maybe more diverse and inviting people from the community and actually get to know that person, suddenly that person's not a stranger and they don't feel so like they're an outsider because they know people in the community. That would just be my thought. So, Tevin, thank you for mentioning Diversity Hiring Coalition. I am the co-chair of that organization, and if you're looking for those resources, how to build these out, you know, how to do policy, how to find, where to recruit. We have 150 business members from all over the state, um, and so we'd be happy to do that, so see me. Uh, we've worked with Liz, my company, Navtour, has worked with Liz, and I just wanted to say that it was probably one of the most rewarding experiences. Um, we were talking about internships earlier, and um, blew my mind. I We brought on a blind marketing intern. And uh, I was like, how will that wizardry work? How is a blind person going to be able to work on our marketing team? And I just want to say that he was fabulous and amazing. And the final thing is a question. So one of the things that I struggle with in my um, journey of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and acceptance um, is uh, being a part of the main community and being a part of organizations mm. that are all white. Mm. So I look around the MTA mm -hmm. membership and I notice that it's mostly white people. So how can we encourage uh, the BIPOC community to become members of Main Tourism Association so that they're here at the table helping mm -hmm. us solve these problems. So I would just encourage all of us um, to look around for those hospitality business owners mm -hmm. that, are, that don't look like us and invite mm -hmm. them to the table. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Curious if you have any thoughts on that as well. Mm -hmm. Somebody left the table. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, uh, I think here in Maine we have the, the, the uh, BIPOC um, 
association, people of color will have brands, people of color will have businesses. I think that will be something uh, maybe the main tourism association can reach out to them and see, hey, you know, we'd love you to be a part of this. That that, that is one way really to to go. Um, but um, also another way is to talk to to your employees that you have, and you know, tell them we'd love we are part of this beautiful and wonderful organization and love. If you know people in the community who can be part of this, but also this is a word for me too. You know, with businesses that I work with. Um, I will try to share the word with them and see if you know we may uh, find some love to to be part of the organization. No, I think uh, that's something we should definitely work on as an association too. <laughs> Any other questions? I know we're keeping you from lunch, so forget <laughs> <laughs> <I> it. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, so thank you so much to our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.